Okay, so I represent the music theory faction at this conference, which is a notably minority fa <laughs> faction. Um, and I'd just like to begin by thanking the organizers, Carlos, Gottfried, Juan, and Robert, for inviting me back uh, to Abu Dhabi for the continuing workshop uh, on musical rhythm. To be invited back could, of course, mean two antithetical things. One, that you did well the first time, so there's interest in hearing more from you. Or two, that you didn't do so well, so here's a chance to redeem yourself. <laughs> I'm not sure which of the two scenarios applies to me, but I'm happy to be here. So I've chosen today not to present my own work, but that of one of our colleagues, Ghanaian ethnomusicologist, Willy Ankuhu, you can see uh, on the screen there. I'll let you figure out which one is Willy. So Anku's work on African rhythm was beginning to gain wide recognition among music theorists and ethnomusicologists at the time of his death in January 2010. I feel certain that he would have been invited to this workshop had he still been with us. Uh, alas, that's no longer possible. So it's fallen to me to introduce just a few of the ideas that he worked with. I'm going to skip the biographical details in the interest of time. Uh, there's a Wikipedia article on Anku. So what motivated Anku's work? Like other born in the tradition scholars, BIT scholars, Anku encountered a literature on African music that sometimes made his blood boil. He couldn't understand why music that he had grown up with and had indeed performed as an adult would be talked about as if it was not based on rational principles, as if it lacked order, as if it was merely improvised, as if it was intrinsically different from other world music, and so on. Anku was inspired, or perhaps counter-inspired, by some of these assertions to seek the organizing principles of African drumming, conceived entirely in orality, within current technologies of writing. His initial aim was not to develop, oh, by the way, this is not gonna change uh, until the very end, so, I mean, you're welcome to look at it, but. <laughs> I also do like some attention here, so. Um, I just noticed that everyone is looking there in expectation. You already have your rhythms of how this thing should move. I mean, you're great at this rhythm workshop. Anyway, uh, it's just a long pause. So. <laughs> um, okay, so now you, I've lost my place. So, so uh, his initial aim was not to develop a single grand theory of African rhythm. Rather, he set out to acquire reliable transcriptions upon which he could base detailed note-by-note -note analysis. The key word is indeed transcription. The transcriber, Anku believed, should transcribe not a specific performance, but a reconstructed composition based on knowledge of its procedural norms. If, as we all believe, the master drummer, like Gideon, um, knows how a composition goes before he arrives at the village square, if he can tell right from wrong in the course of execution, then what matters and what the theorists should seek to capture is what was inside the drummer's head before he embarked on a given performance. The theorist's task, we might say, is to establish the conditions of possibility for a performance by elucidating the baggage that the drama brings to his work. It is not to report the events of a particular performance. And so Anku collaborated with a number of dramas at the School of Performing Arts uh, to reconstruct the compositional structure of several Ghanaian dances. At the time of his death, he had completed eight of these uh, notated texts, if you like, Adwa, Panlogo, Kahu, Bobobo, Agwaja, Kete, Kundum, and Bawa. Now, this may seem a small number given the dozen, dozens of uh, dances that circulate in Ghana alone, but the labor involved was considerable, and the fact that he was working without assistance, uh, unlike Ed, and largely in professional isolation makes his achievement all the more impressive. So according to Anku, the entire dance repertory of Ghana, and by extension other parts of West and Central Africa, 
is based on three sets, 12 set, 16 set, and what he called the cross set. So the 12 set is represented metrically as 12 eight, or as Anku preferred and in fact insisted on two bars of six eight. So he didn't like 12 eight, he wanted two bars of six eight because he thought there was an irreducible duality in the expression of the 12. And there's always something like a call and response, uh, which very rarely divides into six and six, or it's almost never six and six. Yeah. So two bars of six eight. Then the 16 set, uh, which is represented typically as 4-4, four, four. and then a cross set, which could be 12-8 or 4-4, four, four, but will include units that, as it were, cross. So the 12 set, heard in dances like Agbaja, the one that you just heard, and Adwa, the one that I'll be playing you uh, in a little bit, uh, is associated with ceremonial music, 12-8 and ceremonial music. The 16 set, which is heard in dances like Palongo, Gahun, Bobobo, or azonto, is associated with recreational music, uh, which is music often of a recent provenance. And then the cross set uh, is heard in Ieve, Akom, and Tronvu, associated with trance-inducing cult music. This is all Anku's claim. This is a nice little tripartition for those who like grids like that. Unfortunately, it is grossly under-explicated in Anku's work. I'm not going to say anything more about that. I'm going to turn to Adwa, one of the ones that he spent a lot of time with. And this is a 12 set uh, dance. So Adwa is normally beaten by an ensemble consisting of bells, rattles, support drums, and master drum, or the etumpang. Performance would typically begin with preludial material in free or declamatory rhythm. And all the instruments are activated to produce a polyrhythmic texture. Then the lead drummer rides on this texture, using it to compose his own mellow rhythmic narratives. <coughs> Anku was especially interested in the lead drummer's patterns. And so the question is, how are these lead drummer's patterns organized? The lead drummer, by the way, is also sometimes called a master drummer. But many people actually feel that the most authentic description is the mother drum. Uh, because it's a source of uh, life and, and fertility and birth and so on. Those are some of the metaphors that are associated with that. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, play you a little bit of this adwa, uh, but just let me just uh, say something about the basic procedure. So the basic procedure of adwa is to alternate areas of thematic exposition and manipulation with linking passages, they're called bridges, and to end the performance with some sort of closing signal. So the basic form would be something like theme A, elaborated, and then there's a bridge, theme B, elaborated, and there's a bridge, theme C, and so on and so forth, uh, and then the closing signal. So according to Anku, seven such themes are available to the lead drama. These are, um, I was gonna say, these are labeled A to G on your handout, but you don't, you don't have them. So here I'm just gonna do this orally because you're all great musicians. Uh, let me just see if I can find my iTunes here. Okay, so here's the first of the themes. You'll hear the theme and then you'll hear its elaboration. That's the bell and that's the theme. Okay, so now let's hear how it's elaborated. That was one theme and its elaboration. See, another theme and its elaboration. This is theme B. Okay. Now, how is it elaborated? So I could go through all the themes and you would hear the theme at the beginning and then you would hear its elaboration. Uh, and um, I just want to say that each of these themes actually has a, according to Anku, has a verbal basis. So the, the first theme that I played you, Tomikumi, Mini Tomikumi, Adampa. Or the second theme, Adampong, Ejimai, Ejimai Kechiri, Ejimai, and so on. They're all supposed to um, inscribe uh, a, a certain verbal 
uh, theme. So I, I won't bother with the translations and so on. Um, I just want to say about this, and you wonder uh, whether I'm here to sing Anku's praises or actually to uh, critique him, but um, there's so many suggestive things in the work that he did, but he didn't really do all of the work that was, you know, was needed. So the distribution of the grids, for example, that I mentioned was an idea that's just planted there and just never followed up. But this is the sort of thing that you hope you have students who pick up this sort of uh, uh, thing. Um, as far as the verbal basis of the themes that I just played you, so um, Anku claims this verbal origin, but it is not clear whether the verbal phrases came first, in which case they may be said to have generated the rhythmic patterns directly, or whether the words represent an after-the-fact accretion, a kind of convenient alignment designed to facilitate learning uh, of the rhythms. Now, of course, this is a historical question to which we do not as yet have a definitive answer. For now, I think it would be prudent to entertain both, policy, uh, uh, both poss possibilities. So in other words, derivation or non-derivation. I don't know the answer. So looking a little more closely at the themes, um, Anku represents a structural relationship between the theme and the bell pattern by what he calls an RTP, a regulative time point. And the RTPs range from one to 11, and they are reckoned as the interval uh, between the onset of a theme and the point at which it coincides with the regulative pattern. I'm sorry, this is all on my handout. But, um, so theme A, the one that I played you, uh, is an RTP9. Um, there are themes with RTP2, RTP3. Colloquially, and I think this is the point to take away, we might say that the RTP measures the amount of anacrusis inscribed in a theme. So clearly RTP9 has a larger anacrusis than say RTP2, or for that matter RTP1, which has none at all. The point to emphasize is that different themes have different orientations to the regulative beat. And this in turn reflects on the pattern of succession. Uh, in fact, the, the first of these uh, themes that I played with, the RTP9, um, I think one, one of the challenges for people hearing Adwa is that the bell pattern uh, doesn't, the, the, the first onset uh, is nowhere near the actual regulative beat. So, and your instinct, or at least my student's instinct, is to think that the first sound they hear is a friend, and the first sound is not a friend at all. You just have to get used to it. Okay. So, um, Anku, how are these themes? I'm just going back to the themes for a second, and then I'll play you a slightly longer uh, chunk of music. How are the themes uh, el elaborated? Anku provides several categories, and these are all framed in reference to set manipulation. So he says that the drama might employ successive sets, yeah? so immediate repetition of sets. A set may be stated incompletely uh, before acquiring its complement later on. A complement may be partial or full. A set may be masked in part, that is only a subset will be presented. Subsequent sets may be introduced as interpolations, interrupting the exposition of a set. Interpolations may in turn be nested, giving rise to nested interpolations. And then of course, as I mentioned, thematic areas may be interspersed with idiomatic bridges. Sometimes the bridges are false and so on. So the performance as a whole comes across as a manipulation of sets and Anku maps entire performances using circles. Now, time will not allow me to go into any of the details of Anku's analysis, but I think we have enough time just to listen to the master drama or the lead drama or the mother drama narrative of Adwa. So I'm just gonna have you listen to this. I'll uh, shout out a few things as we go along. And this is, of course, a digital recording made by uh, Anku. So this is not a field recording. Those of you who are starved of authenticity, you're not gonna get that. You're getting Anku's uh, you know, man-made or uh, lab-made. Uh, and I won't play the slow version because that would be too easy. But no, let, let me just test you with a slow version. Da, 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 da. That's too slow, okay. So, I know you're comfortable with that, but let's go to the proper version, okay. Okay, he says it's five minutes, so. 
Are you serious? Okay, so this is theme A, and it's elaboration. Bridge. Theme B. Which is being elaborated. Yeah. So still theme B. Bridge. Theme C. Okay, and it's going to go on, but since you told me it's five minutes, I'm going to stop there because I want you to actually see that little bit of video. Okay. Um, I would just comment on this, this idea of this 12 set thing that um, Anku was very keen on and that has you know, a certain amount of explanatory uh, value. Um, so I think. Hmm. Okay, sorry, I'm not doing this very well. Um, let me just, I'll come back to this if we have time. But uh, I just wanted you to see Anku at work in his studio because uh, you're also visually uh, oriented and I think you'd be disappointed if I didn't show you this. Um, this is actually an ambiguous little video because Anku is working with ma one of the master drummers uh, and they're trying to decide on the, uh, the bell pattern for another Akan dance, Kundum. I think there's an interesting miscommunication here, which I'm leaving you to figure out. Uh, and here's Anku and Mr. Chermating. I'm talking with uh, Mr. Chermating, he's a master drummer. Um, he has helped me in some of the uh, research that I'm doing. Now, you're focusing on one particular bell pattern, which is the bell pattern for Kundum. There are two bell patterns involved, but this particular one poses uh, an interesting problem that I want to bring about. Can you play the, uh, the Kundum bell pattern for me? So that's Anku, obviously. That's the master drummer. That's the bell pattern for Kundum. Mm -hmm. Well, with this pattern, there's a pause that goes with it. Yes. Let me let me cut the pause and then you play it. It's showing you where the pulse is. This bell pattern, all right, and I would like you to listen to the result of it. Okay. With the pause. This is the result. What, what do you think? Uh, the way I listen to it, uh, it's not precise. Mm. There, there's something wrong with it. Yeah, there's something wrong with it. Wrong with it. Yes. Okay, now, now I'm going to try to trick it in one way okay. and see whether that is the correct one. Oh. Okay, I, I have here the, oh. the old one, the, the one that you said is not good, and I've done something to, uh, to that rhythm. Oh. And you, we have the two of them here. I'd like you to listen to the second one. Okay. okay. So what, what do you think of this? This, this is now it, it, it feels like it is. Okay, now let's, let's look at, listen to the, to the old one again and then compare with the new one. The old one is. And the new one is. You can hear a slight difference, can't you? Yeah. You see, for instance, this one, mm -hmm. if, I, if I have to demonstrate it, yeah. and you see the difference, right. Right, yeah. you can stop it and I'll show you something. Okay, let's stop it and I'll see, show you This is the precise one. Something. And it goes like... And the, and the second one, that was not precise. He yeah. said that was not precise. The Anku says it's the precise one. Yeah. But if you listen to it from the speaker, yes. you may think it's, it's precise. precise. Right. It's not of course, the, the difference between the old one and the new one is a, is a 30 second note yeah, difference. That's right. 30 second note difference. That's, that's what it is. So you're able to tell the difference between 
uh, you know, the, 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 that zero variation yes. between the first person and the second person. And, you are, and if you are not careful, yeah. you think it's, it's correct. Yes. But there's something That's small that you should realize yeah. that makes it precise. precise. Uh, okay. So this is Anku's reconstruction of the hole. And Mr. Chermating is going to do a little dance to show you how you actually embody this dance. Okay, sorry, just in the interest of time. Um, I wasn't quite expecting my five minutes to go so <laughs> so quickly. So, but I just have to make a couple of points. You can keep it respectful, so no, 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 no. I want to hear what you have to say. So I want to have my cake and eat it. And stop interrupting me, so I can actually <laughs> go on with it. So, um, just to comment on two aspects of Anku's theory, and then to conclude. Okay. So, two points. One has to do with this idea of twelve and. Um, what I say here is that the idea of thinking in modules of 12, of course, makes logical sense, especially if you've determined that a dance like Adwa, uh, the one that I played you earlier, uses a 12 set. But does the assignment of 12 report a conscious composition process? Uh, I have some doubts about this. It seems likely that what is compositionally salient is the motivic discourse, which after all is at the core of the drama's communicative strategy. Set manipulation, we might say, resides at a less immediate structural level. It is an outcome, not part of the message of the moment. Yeah. That's one. The other thing uh, concerns the regulative beats. Since there's so much talk about uh, beats uh, at this rhythm conference, um, I thought I'd throw in just a comment here. So, um, Anku refers to a regulative beat. This is a term he borrows from Inketia. And I must confess that I've never understood why so much ink has been spilt over the idea of the existence of a regulative beat. What else do musicians in these traditions anyway, the African, the West, and Central African countries, what else do they rely upon when they make music together? Just watch the dances. Everything will fall in place. Now, Anku's problem here is that as a born in the tradition scholar, he underreports the impulses that lead him to assign the regulative beat. This happens to um, you know, anyone who is born in a tradition. Your task is not to talk, your task is to do. Uh, so sometimes uh, the actual impulses are underreported. So this has led some of his critics, some of Anku's critics, to search internally for the regulative beat among the sounding forms only. But the regulative beat and attendant meter are not always evident from the sounding forms alone. They may represent a disposition or attitude brought to the music, almost in counterpoint to it. So metrical attitudes, of course, are deeply cultural and without an understanding of the kinds of preferences exercised within a given community, one is not likely to locate the beat correctly. It's a pity, I think, that we're no longer able to benefit from these and other aspects of Anku's taken for granted knowledge of African music. So just to conclude, Anku belongs uh, to a group of scholars for whom transcription uh, is uh, indispensable. Uh, A.M. Jones, David Locke, Simha Arom, Gilbert Rouget, Branda Lacerda, Mekin Zewi, among others. I'm thinking about people who've worked on African music and Western Central African music. Transcription was a means to an end. The end being, of course, to illuminate the organizing principles of African rhythm. There are also resonances between his work and that of, shall we call them, number and shape-oriented scholars, like Jeff Pressen and Gottfried, who is sitting at the back there. Um, but in one particular respect, um, which is that of establishing an analyzable text, establishing an analyzable text. In this particular respect, I think Anku's strongest affinities are with Simha Arom. Both scholars sought possibilities and idealizations. Rather than merely transcribing field performances, they provided us with reconstructed holes that captured the essence of a composition. Both also appropriated technology as an aid, 
Uh, and it is ironic that on the one occasion on which the two of them met in Valladolid in Spain in 2005, there was a very interesting conference there, uh, a fist fight almost broke out over the question of symmetry and asymmetry in African timeline patterns. If you want to know the full story, buy me a beer tonight and I'll tell you. <laughs> So it's my understanding that Anku's uh, book, this uh, forthcoming book, which he actually didn't quite finish when he passed away, uh, will appear soon uh, uh, on the list of the University of Michigan Press. Uh, it'll likely emerge as the strongest attempt by a born in the tradition scholar to provide a coherent theory of rhythmic organization in African drum music. I fear that the delayed publication of a book whose initial ideas date back to the mid-1980s will not accelerate the absorption of Anku's ideas, for cognate matters have surfaced in the meantime in the works of other scholars. I would nevertheless uh, like to salute Fowili, as we called him, for the many doors he opened to the world of African rhythm and for reinforcing, through example, the value of positive empirical research and uh, rigorous music analysis. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I think we have time for like one or two quick questions. Anyone? The themes are predefined, or is it? Uh, you said there are a number of themes, and then the are they fixed or? Yeah. So for for the adora that he reconstructed, these are themes that would be known okay. to drummers. So they're predefined. Yes. And the, the 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 actual succession in a work in a performance are not predefined necessarily. Okay. Obviously, the closing signal has to come at the end, mm -hmm. uh, but they can be you know they can be uh, permu permutated in some form. Any question, anyone? Oh. Sorry, so do the bridges, right, are the bridges always the same? Do they develop in any way? Are they connected to each other so that they develop from the first one? Do they develop in no. a similar way that the themes develop? Or what do we know about the bridges? In, in this reconstruction, the bridges uh, are very obviously syncopated, more heavily syncopated than the thematic expositions themselves. They are not all exactly the same length. You know, um, and there are also false bridges. So sometimes uh, uh, a theme exposition will be interrupted by, say, a segment of a bridge. You think, well, yes, yeah, we are moving on to another theme, but actually, no. There's unfinished business. Let's do that before we go on. So I haven't actually counted it, but if you're just asking how many bars there, I haven't counted that. But we have the score, so you, you can look it up. But the bridge material, at least for this reconstruction, uh, is uh, is very similar. I just want to say identical, but it's very so. The, the underlying procedure, though, is, is pretty much the same. And you recognize it as being different from the actual thematic exposition. Yeah. Thank you. Any question here, Robert? So, with this idea of two six eights, uh, even in Anku's transcription, he moved it by a 30 second note, which implies that it didn't quite work, even for him. And then the drummer said that's not accurate either. So. Is there something wrong? Is there some inherent tension with the idea of two six eights? Is there some other way that we might write this down that would be more true to the material itself? Um, well, I I don't know. I think Anko's reason for insisting on the two six eights uh, for Adwa that that was Kundum, by the way. I, I, uh, but for Adwa was simply that he felt that very often underlying these patterns, there's a responsorial element, you know, um, which some people would say is it's asymmetrical because they're counting beats, but actually Anku says, no, it's, it's not asymmetrical. But there's a responsorial element, and he felt that the duality of two six eights making a 12 eight somehow helps you to think uh, of, that, uh, of that underlying duality. Um, the specific issue they were arguing about there um, I think just has to do with the mass drummer's world and the situation in which he's working. And I don't think they were communicating entirely um, because the professor is sitting there saying, this is what I have done. Then the lead drummer says, well, yeah, no, yeah, that one is correct. Yeah, that one is correct now. And then a, a moment later he says, no, 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 but let me show you. I think we need a little bit more context to know what uh, Mr. Shamateng was, was thinking when he was being asked to, uh, you know, to validate what Anku uh, had done. So 
I, I don't know what the final answer there is. Maybe Gideon can help us uh, at some point. But that's a situation in which he was working. Um, he did tell me just anecdotally, Uncle, that um, he once heard uh, a lead drummer drum a doigt, and afterwards he told the guy in public, you know, just after the thing, he said, you know, you didn't do that correctly. And the lead drummer was very upset. How do you say that to a master drummer? He didn't drum correctly. But according to Uncle, the very next morning, the guy came to his house at 5 o'clock in the morning and said, you were right, uh, that he didn't, they, they messed up somehow. And Uncle claims that his understanding, of course, came from reconstructing the dance. And the lead drummer says, well, we know what we're doing. And yet he was able, by virtue of this reconstruction, uh, to correct uh, a master drummer. Now, of course, that's an anecdote from the person who did the correcting, so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Barak, you still have one quick question? Well, actually, it's about the role of uh, since we were I'm not sure this is a question. It's not really a question, but I'm very interested in this, and I have answers beyond, as I you know, did question uh, Willy Anku on, on these, these matters which you've presented when I had the opportunity at City University in London sometime in the 90s. So I do have answers to these points, which I would be thrilled to discuss. Um, but I, I think that there, the conflict which we've seen in that discussion is actually a mistake of Anku's ability to notate the fastest music. And, and there will be reasons why, why that happens. I'm not saying he's not a gifted analyst or musician, but that's caused a notational difficulty which seems to negate his position on, well, we put this in you know, bars of six or 12 units mm -hmm. for, per, per time cycle, you know, or 16, and that's a problem which I myself, when I had to learn this music, I was like, okay, I need to get my head around this, and it took a long time. So is it a metrical mistake, or is it just the note value? The, the mistake is on, on the Kundun, Kundun uh, yeah. example, yeah. in slow down. Sorry, everybody, but you seem all thrilled now. Um, this is the time. Uh-huh. If I do it at this speed, which is almost half the speed, it falls very neatly into 12 divisions. Tack, 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 yeah? And when you speed it up to the speed that the music is at, tack, 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 If you're looking at the simplest level of three divisions or four divisions, you see it, you know, to this slower pulse, then it's very difficult to understand. Also, the speed and the execution means that to repeat a note quickly, you have to move your hand fast, and it relaxes, and, and it, it's, that's one of the issues. The second issue is that the grid itself, represented by a computer, every division is equal. But in the swing of the music, and the movement of the body, which replicates the, the divisions of the, of the time, actually that grid itself, instead of being three divisions in each beat, might itself be might not be equal. And that gives a very, very big notational problem because when you take the whole thing out of context, you're then, okay, well, this sounds like it could be two divisions here, three divisions here, four divisions here. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, because it's out of context, that grid is not present for the, the person to play the, the part out, out of the, the entire ensemble. And then you listen to it in isolation, you're like, okay, I can't understand this. I make this assumption, I make this assumption, and then both are bad. And the drum is saying, this is not right, that's not right, this is how it is. And in the drummer's head is the full music, and in the analyst's head, well, this other stuff that's in the drummer's head, he can't hear it. So he doesn't know what it's fitting into. And, and I went through this process. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, this was the one which had a big problem, to be honest. But I, I have other supporting evidence from other situations where I think, mm -hmm. well, yeah, th there would be ways of, of not seeing this as some weird isolated example and, and a, a disagreement about something, but that it's got a, an inherent problem and the notation, which it makes it look like a different disagreement. Mm -hmm. So the moral of the story is what that we should defer to the performance. <laughs> Yeah. The only thing I would say is, and I fully agree with them, I think that's interesting. Maybe we could gather with a few people who are interested in this and talk about it over lunch. But um, there's always a, a gap between what you know, or, or think of it as a supplement, some sort of supplementary knowledge that you bring to 
um, your execution uh, of a pattern. So if you noted that triplet, and by the way, Anku did the same thing you're doing to him now, to one of our composers, Amu, when he said, Amu just didn't know how to notate what he wanted in his music. And he was able to show that by, you know, having, um, by playing back what Amu had written and then playing to Amu what Amu intended. Um, and, and it emerged that, you know, this was the case, that the composer himself had noted the thing incorrectly, so to speak. But that's through Anku's intervention. So I think these slippages do happen, but all I was saying is that sometimes there is a convention uh, of notation, and if you read it mechanically, um, you'll get one result, but the people who have the supplementary knowledge, because you know jazz musicians know this all the time, will inflect the thing in a certain way. Um, I don't know whether that applies here, but that would certainly be a consideration. Yeah, I propose that the discussion continues over lunch a little bit late. Thank you so much, Coffee. Thank you. Thank you.